on to the growth stage competition. Eric Rosenfeld co-founded the Oregon Angel Fund in 2007 as an experiment to combine the collective horsepower of a select group of active, accomplished angel investors and entrepreneurs with the rigor and discipline of a professional venture fund. A fourth generation Portlander and former entrepreneur, Eric believes strongly in the transformative power of community and entrepreneurship and is proud of the fund's role in helping to shape Oregon's economic future. He received his MBA from the Institute for Management Development in Lausanne, Switzerland, and has degrees in Industrial Engineering and American Studies from Stanford. And for Eric, the Oregon Angel Fund is a way to collaborate with old friends and make new friends in a manner that's fun and rewarding on many levels. Come on up and let's make distance friends, Eric. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, thanks for having me. And Delighted to, delighted to be here. This year, 20, over 29 companies applied for this growth stage segment, and the companies applied from all across the country. And then the, the BVC LLC, then after many meetings and many hours of diligence, narrowed that group down to five. And these are the five that we're gonna hear from today. They've been carefully selected and curated and coached. Uh, so that their pitch will be at perfection, and to, to be pitch perfect, which now that I think about it, could be a name for some kind of TV musical comedy. Um, it, they're, they're pitch perfect partly because Pam Stevenson, the delightful Pam Stevenson, has helped coach these companies so that they are pitch perfect today. And so, with that, our first company to share their story with us today in the growth stage category is Pet Hub from Wenatchee, Washington, a central hub to manage your pet's life, helping owners share data safely while also finding trusted services and information. Please join me in welcoming to the stage founders Tom Arnold and Lorian Clemens. Hey, everybody. Okay. Hi, my name is Tom Arnold, and I'm so excited to be part of the Ben Venture Conference. I'm sure many of you love your pet like any family member, maybe even more. Uh, this is my cat Houdini and my dog Uller, and I love these guys so much. And then I experienced the worst fear of any pet parent. Houdini was lost. She got spooked in the garage one morning and bolted. She was gone, and of course I panicked. Uh, I'm sure many of you have had this experience and it's pretty terrifying when it happens. So I scrambled to make lost pet posters. I sh I'm sure you've seen those kinds of things stapled up around your neighborhood. I called shelters and I prayed the information on her microchip was up to date because I had no idea how to change it if it wasn't. I felt pretty helpless all day and into the night, but I was lucky. Houdini came home around 4 a.m. the next morning. Other families aren't so lucky. Did you know that one in three animals will be lost in their lifetime, and when they are lost, less than 5% of cats and 15% of dogs are returned home? Plus, one and a half million pets are euthanized in shelters every year. It's staggering. At the time Houdini pulled her disappearing act, I worked at Microsoft on the project now known as Office 365, managing code releases monthly and sometimes weekly. So here I was, seasoned software engineer with a computer science degree from Purdue, and the only resource I had to get my lost pet back was homemade posters stapled to a telephone poles and hoping her microchip was up to date. Losing a pet happens so fast and you can feel so alone when it happens. I realized then that I could bring or I could build a tech-based community solution that would work better than posters, microchips, and ID tags that only have a single phone number on it. Welcome to Pet Hub. I'm joined today by my co-founder, Lorraine Clemens, and also my COO, and I will let Lorraine tell you about what it is that we do. Thank you so much, Tom. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having us here today. So Pet Hub provides a modern pet ID tag that is much, much more than just a tag. How many of you actually stop and answer your phone when you get a call from a number you don't recognize? Well, if you're like most people, you don't. But what if while you're at work and you think your pet is home, they actually aren't and someone's found them on the street and is trying to get a hold of you? Or what if you're traveling and you just simply can't be reached? Well, if they can't reach you, they're going to call the local shelter. It happens every single day. 
But what if your pet had a safety circle of five, six, maybe even 10 people that all got a text message, email, and phone call the minute that someone found them and they were given GPS inf location information? And what if, in a matter of pushing a button, you could send a pet Amber Alert to all the local shelters? And what if, in seconds, you could create a virtual lost pet poster that you could share across all your social media? And what if that same place that you trusted to protect your pet also provided you with verified resources and opportunities to, for all of your pet's needs and wants? Well, that's what Pet Hub is and so much more. So today we have over 560,000 pets registered on PetHub.com. And here's how it works. We have a QR code pet ID tag that has a toll-free number with live operators, yes, live human beings available round the clock to help your lost pet get home. All you have to do is simply scan the QR code or call the phone number and notifications are instantly sent. People get the tag at pethub.com or they get them through their local municipalities when they license their pet. And the best part is, drum roll please, this isn't an ID tag plus a license tag plus a rabies tag all jingling every time your pet moves. Pet Hub has all the information that is needed on one simple tag. This allows you to have peace of mind to just simply play with and enjoy your pet. But our vision extends far beyond protection. There's so much for you and your pet to learn. Exercise, proper food and diet, training, socialization, not to mention vet care and grooming and how the heck do they get outside while you're at work and they need to go to the bathroom? It can be overwhelming and downright confusing. And every pet parent has to slice and dice across multiple apps, products and services to get the full picture of what their pet needs. Well, our vision is a platform that connects all these aspects of your pet's life with a three-part plan. First and foremost, protect your pet with a Pet Hub proprietary tag. Next, share data safely with a wide range of pet providers and services. Imagine, you can instantly send your pup's vaccination records down to the new dog bar that's down the street, and you and she can simply walk into yappy hour without having to fill out a single piece of paperwork. And finally, nurture your pet through their entire life. Let's say that your pup is scared of big noises. Well, through our sponsored content and exclusive deals, everything that you need to help her will be right there at your fingertips. So let's talk about traction. Where are we now? 96% of pet of pets are recovered within 24 hours and less than 2% of them end up in a shelter. That's a big deal for pets and parents, of course, but it's a huge deal for shelters. So once the word got out about Pet Hub and our success, shelters started calling us. So in 2016, we pivoted our sales to focus on and co-brand with municipalities to include Pet Hub tags as part of their licensing and rabies tag programs. If we take a quick look at how economics currently work for our protect segment of the business, Every tag we sell into a municipality equates to just over $1.50 of revenue, and our site generates $40 annual recurring revenue per paid subscriber today at a 60% gross margin. And our numbers continue to improve as we refine our approaches. So just how big is this market? We estimate there are over 60 million dogs reachable through our channels that we're building. That's just dogs. In total, that's a $2.5 billion opportunity for Pet Hub. And we've only just scratched the surface, having added the majority of our 560,000 pets, pet profiles in just the last three years. In short, we've picked the lock on reaching our core audience. And now we need to scale and fully launch our share and nurture business models, which represent even greater opportunities. We're really excited about the future of Share, which is our data integration piece, and Nurture, which is all about advertising revenue, and what those two bring to our solid protect base. As of today, we've achieved nearly 700000 in annual recurring net revenue through our protect sector. We project net revenue from all sectors of our platform will be over $10 million in the next four years. As far as competitive landscape, Pet Hub is in a really unique position. You see, our tags are required license or rabies tags. We literally have trusted industry authorities widely distributing our tags and encouraging data entry. 
I'm most excited about the extraordinary leadership team that we have at PetHub. I've been a co-founder and founder in several successful tech startups. Lorian's won multiple pet industry awards the last the past, over the past few years. Morgan Woodward joined PetHub, bringing 15 years of animal welfare and government experience. And Sherry Hagopian, PetHub's general counsel, joined the team full-time as our director of customer services. Our entire team is passionate about pets and adding value to our company and the community. At the end of the day, this is truly why we do what we do. Since the first pet was found through our platform, we've reunited almost 25,000 pets with their families. And with your help, we'll have even more happy tales to tell. Thank you for letting us share our story. And for those of you that are at the live event today, make sure you pick up one of the tags that we've left there. Those gifts are for you at the registration tables. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Eric, I'm going to let you take the first question. Sure. Thanks, Shannon. I, I, I love it. And congratulations, Tom and Lorian, on, on the, the great traction and market reception that you've been receiving so far. That's really Thank fabulous. You. I, Thank I you. love the idea. It's like the dog tags they wear in the military, except for dogs. Dog tags for dog tags for dogs. It's a, <laughs> brilliant. All makes sense. <laughs> it's brilliant. Um, so I, I, but I'd love to, to learn more about your, your business model and, uh, and how you're tracking things. You know, I, I know people are very sensitive about their health records being, you know, sensitive records being shared with the government. I imagine you're not going to share pet data with the government, but you might share sensitive data with marketing companies. And I'm wondering how that might figure in and other ways of leveraging uh, the customer relationship. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the whole, exactly. That's, mm -hmm. that's basically was beaten into our brain at Microsoft where they, they're all about personally identifiable information, PII. Um, and so it's in our terms of use, our terms of service for all of our users. We make it very clear that the data is theirs, that we're, um, we only let the data that they choose to share be shared. So when the tag is scanned, it hide, we can hide and show what data is shown. Um, as a matter of fact, when somebody scans a tag, you can have it where it only shows your pet's name uh, when you're viewing the pet's profile. And you could call our call center and our call center will be able to see all the information, but they won't give it out. Uh, we will actually bridge the phone call to the owner and then anybody on that safety circle list for the pets. So we'll actually go down step-by-step step until we reach somebody, but we won't, we won't give out any of that information. And if I could add on too, uh, when you, you mentioned marketing companies, and that is actually part of what we're looking at with the share part of our platform is that, that da the data insights. That data that we would be sharing with say a, a marketing uh, insight uh, company would be anonymized. It would be stripped right. of everything that was personally identifiable about the pet and the pet owner. Very good. I feel like this is very affirming for those of us who um, acknowledge that our pets are our children are like uh, just like any other family member. This is like, I'm like, oh gosh, I can get some help taking my guy to soccer practice. I don't know, I'm just going off on a tangent here. But um, do we have any questions from the audience? Should this replace the microchip or would it supplement the microchip? That's a great question. Uh, it's definitely not meant to replace the microchip it's meant as a supplement. We consider the microchip an important safety net. The whole beautiful value about what our tags do is that anybody can get your pet home quickly. Um, that's the reason we're returning them so quickly. Um, the problems with microchips, again, great safety net, but the problems that they've run into over the years is about half of the data on microchips is out of date, whether it was never activated or somebody moved and never updated it because they didn't remember which company they were with. Um, the other problem is you have to take the animal to a shelter or to a vet to be scanned. And a lot of people aren't willing to take them to the vet, uh, shelter, uh, either because they're too busy or because they're afraid of releasing the pet and it's going to be euthanized. So it's all about making it super easy where anyone, any one of us with our smartphones, where you can dial the phone number on the tag or scan the tag, anybody can get this pet home. Yeah, it's really, it's really genius, actually, because I know, too, another problem is when your pet goes missing, it could get into pet jail, which is the bail is like quite expensive. I know me and all other pet owners are like have stress around this. So it seems like it can alleviate that pain point. Does Pet Hub staff the call center? We actually, we actually do the 
first level tier. So we will answer tickets and we will answer phone calls. Um, but we have a 24 by seven call center that supplements us. They're actually located here in our town in Wenatchee. Wonderful. And um, let's see here, next question. Can this or should this expand to kids? <laughs> That's not my so, question. Well, there's actually a funny little story. No, um, <laughs> we're not HIPAA, HIPAA compliant. But the funny story, I remember several years back, I, we would get notifications, you know, when new pets come on, you can always go look and see the new pets. And there was somebody, there was a pet named Jacob. And I thought, well, that's an interesting name for a pet. <laughs> Turns out it was a nine-year-old boy. Uh, and uh, so it was one of those things, wrote the, you know, wrote the parents you know, just so you know, all this information can be seen. So, so you're going to have to we, put like a little disclaimer on there. We, yeah, we asked people not to do that. We, we've also been asked if we wanted to repurpose this for elder care and things like that, because um, it could be uh, super helpful for somebody who's suffering from dementia and things like that. Um, but uh, we focus squarely on the pet space. Very good. Um, what would funding do for Pet Hub if you won? Funding, so... Um, the main idea is that, as Lorian was pointing out, we've nailed the protect piece. And so now we have to build the nurture and uh, the share and nurture pieces. So share is the API, the open API that we'd be creating to allow others to integrate with us. Um, and we've already done that with uh, a couple of shelter uh, management programs out there. And then the nurture piece, that's, that's a model that already exists that people have done over and over and over again. It's the ad revenue where we have content on the site. Um, you can have very uh, specific personalized information sent to your inbox. Um, if anybody's ever used Baby Center or anything like that, where it sends out emails to you saying your, your baby is now this old and here's some things to consider and um, that kind of thing. So that's, that's, those are the pieces that we haven't built yet uh, fully. And so we'd basically be filling, uh, building those and that would be moving us uh, very quickly up in higher revenue. I think that. And can you talk about how COVID has impacted you this year, if at all? Yeah, I'm happy to. So um, there's a couple of things. At first, at first, some of the um, distribution of tags, because shelters had to be closed through much of the country, the physical people going, taking into the shelter to get the license and things like that had to be closed. So we had a small dip in distribution at the beginning, but we've helped our partners work through a lot of those distribution problems. And now we're back up to the level that they were pre-COVID. But the exciting thing is, is that our sales channel, which we used to do a lot of things out in uh, trade shows and conferences and things like that to, to bring in municipalities, we obviously that couldn't happen. But what we have had is a tremendous influx of incoming leads. And we've actually closed more people this year because specifically of COVID than we had in previous years, because now municipalities are realizing, wow, we need a more modern approach to lost pet recovery. We need something that can be digitalized and be faster to keep these pets out of the shelter. Uh, and you know, we our system is so successful in what we do, less than 2% of the pets that are using our tags actually hit the shelter door. We've had municipalities that are using our tags save tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars because of the reduction of animals coming into their shelter. So that's kind of, that, that kind of does the light bulb moment for a lot of municipalities that were coming out there. So for, from our perspective, COVID has, um, has helped our business. Yeah, sales have actually gone up and costs for reaching people has gone down dramatically. I love to hear that. Have you considered partnering with pet insurance providers? <laughs> we actually so you do. Say that. <laughs> so yes, we do actually um, have a number of uh, relationships, and a lot of them are uh, a white label type of situation, or we provide an ID tag for their members, that type of thing. Uh, and that is something that we're we're actually looking to grow. Uh, we're we're even working on becoming uh, licensed uh, for that whole thing, so that we can be even more. Um, proactive for our members and helping our pet hub members get a better um, better feel of what's going on in the pet insurance. And industry. that's the beauty too about the open API is that um, any company would be able to integrate with us so that the, the hub of your pet's information, whether it's insurance, whether it's uh, different treats or whatever that you've chosen to integrate with, even dog walking services, all of that can be handled and managed aggregated in one place. That's great. Can you enter the microchip ID to the pet hub? was one of my questions as well. Yes, um, yeah, we collect everything. So if you wanna put in your microchip ID, those kinds of things, we're also, we can't say the name, but we're also integrating with a large microchip company. Um, and so we'll be feeding at, at the user's choice, if they want to, they can share their microchip into a large registry so that it's 
it, you don't have to just look at us. You can be looking at other places. That's great. Um, let's see, any other questions from you, Eric? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting market to, to try to reach, and it sounds like you're working with municipalities on one end, but for reaching families with pets, how can you do that efficiently and effectively? What, what's your cost, customer acquisition costs? And, and go to market strategy to reach pet yeah. owners. So, uh, so we actually started direct to consumer. Um, and we found out quickly it was death by a thousand paper cuts. Um, so going in through the retail channels and things like that. We found that starting, uh, going with the municipality through the pet licensing channel actually has given us a tremendous reach quite quickly because they have very established distribution channels already there. But the next step that we've been uh, getting into, and actually it started through our municipalities, was through rabies tags. So while not everybody necessarily licensed their pets, everybody does get rabies vaccinations for their pets. And that is something that we're just now moving into. We have several municipalities that we, we are working as the rabies tag for their entire community. Uh, and we have several large veterinarian groups as well that we're gonna be moving into doing that as well. Excellent. So customer acquisition costs can be pretty low. Yeah, actually it was compared to what we were doing on the consumer level where, where we were spending a ton of money to get somebody on our site. It's a fraction to do it through our current channels. Oh, that's excellent. Well, I'm, I'm really excited for you. I think this is solving a, more than one problem and, and it's just awesome to hear from both of you. So thank you, Tom and Lorian, and good luck. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. It's been an honor to be here. Fabulous. And so start with pets, then there's children, aging parents, lots of opportunity. Um, so next up is a world-changing idea. And whoever said one person can't change the world never ate an undercooked bat. And they never met Andrew Kim. Andrew Kim is the COO and founder of Plover. And Plover is revolutionizing and disrupting the car wash industry and making the world a better place. So please join me in welcoming to the stage, Andrew Kim. All right, well thank you very much everyone and for your time. I'm Andrew, co-founder of Plover, where we build intelligently simple robotics that enable unparalleled car wash performance. So Plover actually grew from a personal problem that my partner Victor and I shared as obsessed car enthusiasts who love clean cars. And as kids, we remember that car washes were truly magical to us. But as we grew up, that magic vanished, and we found ourselves frustrated. And we're thinking to ourselves, car washes with brushes never uh, cause scratches. Touchless washes never really do that great of a job. And then we learned that hydrofluoric acid is still widely used in the industry, and it not only dissolves your bones, it dissolves stainless steel, concrete, glass, pretty much everything on your car and in a car wash. And so with all of this combined with the fact that car wash tech just hadn't fundamentally changed in over half a century, compelled us to look for a better solution. And when we look at the market opportunity, it's clear that we're not the only ones who love our cars and want to keep them clean. There are over 100,000 locations in the US across three major car wash segments. Self-serves, where you clean your own car. Inbay Automatics, where you have one car in one bay at a time as the system moves over it. And then you have conveyor tunnels, where you feed a bunch of cars onto a conveyor belt as they pass through different series of wash equipment. And so every year, these owners spend about $2.5 billion on their hardware, and their customers spend about $12.5 billion on car washes. But if you combine the top 50 car wash chains in the US together, you only get about 1,800 locations, less than 2% of all of the market. And we're wondering why is it so fragmented? And it turns out car washing is really hard to scale right now. Whether you're renovating or building from scratch, it takes up to 18 months with up to a dozen or more third-party vendors, and you're spending almost a million or more with an average break-even time of 10 years. And at Plover, we have a very different vision for what car wash experiences should be like for both owners and their customers and it begins with the world's most efficient car wash robot. So our amazing team of engineers have built an in-house five-axis robotic system that looks and behaves very similarly to a giant 3D printer. First, we take a millimeter precision 3D scan of each vehicle, which then allows our algorithm to create a truly customized wash, which guides our robotic system as it contours the surface. For the 3D scan, we use the same kind of LiDAR that you find on self-driving cars. And our wash algorithm not only optimizes for performance, it also minimizes utility consumption. And our multi-axis robotics allows us to wash more quickly and precisely than any other system, getting every nook and cranny current car washes miss. 
And so with our process and system, we can reduce water consumption, chemical usage, and wash times by up to 50%, helping owners break even in less than half the time they do today. And better yet, as they can enjoy a one-stop shopping experience with Plover, where all they have to do is provide land permits and utilities, and we'll take care of the rest for less than half the upfront cost, further helping them break even in less than half the time. And as we're going to market to existing car washes, we can install our system in an existing bay with existing permitting in one day. So where are we at today? We're going after the 400 car washes, these compact car washes in Oregon and Washington. These are self-serves and in-bay automatics because they have the exact infrastructure we already need in place, and they also feel the biggest pains. They're overpaying for aging, underperforming equipment, which at all times, 10 to 15% needs replacement. And compared to other owners, they spend the highest percentage of the gross revenue on chemical costs. We're really fortunate to have some of the most amazing industry partners along our, to help us on our way, and in particular, Brown Bear Car Wash. It's the lar uh, largest operator in the Pacific Northwest with over 56 locations across all three car wash segments. And they've given us complete access to all their sites, their equipment rooms, their entire maintenance staff, which has been in-house for 50 years or more, and all their financials so that we know exactly which metrics we need to be prioritizing as we continue to build. Better yet, they've agreed to be one of our first customers, and so Lance at Brown Bear and Craig at Clean Planet Car Wash collectively want five systems, each representing 300,000 up front with recurring fees, and they've agreed to be showcase sites, which means they're renovating their bays around our system. We get to use these sites as additional sales channels to invite future customers to see a live operation, and we have the right to use all of what we learn from these sites in our future sales and marketing materials. We're also discussing additional showcase site deals with Flying Frog Car Wash here in Bend, used to be called Bend Car Wash, and Solar Car Wash in Berkeley, California. And when we look a little bit ahead, one of Plover's goals is to sell 100 systems in the next two and a half years. And to do that, we have three major opportunities. One are major trade shows like the Car Wash Show in Vegas, which has over 10,000 industry professionals attending. Then we have major distribution partners like Northwest Wash Systems and Simon Eyes, and I'll go over those a little bit later. And then we have the Car Wash Roundtable. And so I'm wondering, what is this roundtable? Well, Lance, the owner of uh, Brown Bear, is one of the leading members. And this roundtable consists of the top 10 or so largest privately owned car wash chains in the US. And these owners meet biannually to discuss the latest and greatest industry trends, as well as decide on the next best wash equipment. And so we have a standing offer from Lance to get introduced and promoted to this roundtable when Plover is ready to scale nationally. And so with Brown Bear Clean Planet Car Wash and the additional pending deals, we also have a total of about 30 owners who have been coming for sales demos, which began about a month and a half ago, and we are well on track to hit our first major milestone of six systems sold by next year. And of course, none of this would have been possible without our amazing team. Uh, Nathan and Max, they are two mechanical engineers, and they live and breathe everything robotics and 3D printing. Straight out of university, they founded their own company called FormForge, which specialized in industrial-scale six-axis robotic 3D printing. And through FormForge, they actually won one of NASA's centennial challenges for 3D printed habitats. And Mike, our unicorn software engineer, is single-handedly responsible for all of our scanning and wash algorithms. And before Plover, he helped build a 3D geometry kernel for CATIA and SOLIDWORKS, which are CAD programs that our engineers use. And as a cherry on top, he helps us understand the chemistry of how we wash cars with his PhD in chemical engineering, for which he simulated molecular compounds at the atomic level. Our expert advisors are some of the most well-known and respected individuals in the industry, and so I'll focus on the bottom, since we mentioned the top. Bill Gora is the president and owner of Simon Eyes USA, the largest car wash chemical company in the nation, with nationwide distribution networks for both chemicals and wash equipment. And then John Keevey owns Northwest Wash Systems, one of the most trusted and successful Northwest full-service distributors, with over 140 businesses in his portfolio, over 300 site builds, and he helped launch the Water Wizard system by Coleman Hanna about 25 years ago, which was one of the most popular systems of its time. And John Allen is our very first advisor who donated $30,000 in wash equipment to help us build our prototype, which helped win the 2018 BBC early stage competition. So to get to this point, Victor and I put in $140,000 of our own money to help fund the proof of concept and get validation from Brown Bear. And we kicked off the pre-seed round with the 2018 BBC and closed $1.7 million in order to secure our core team and productize our full system. And now we're raising 18 months of runway to deploy the first six systems in Oregon and Washington in order to validate real-world unit economics and reach positive cash flow by Q1 next year. And so it's time to bring back some magic into the car wash industry. This is our system in our headquarters in Portland.
Thank you very much. Well done, Andrew. This is such a cool idea. Um, I'm going to let Eric give you the first question. Yeah, yeah. And, and congrats, Andrew, on all that you've accomplished and oh, getting to this much. point and getting these, these uh, pilots in place. So my, my first question is, over the next 18 months with the six installations, what is it that you want to learn? What do you have to learn from mm -hmm. those deployments? So I think there's two most critical parts. And the first is one of the things I mentioned is the unit economics. So we've done a lot of research, looked at existing car washes, different systems, the financials from Brown Bear and other, other car washes we work with. And so we know what the unit economics should look like for a normal car wash. And then we know theoretically and also through internal testing what improvements our system should make. But we can't say that's going to be fact in the real world. And car wash owners are never going to believe us by ourselves to say, trust us, spend $300,000 and go away. So they're going to want to see a real world operation. And then once we have these unit economics in place and can say that came from a real world site, that's, that's one big chunk of eliminating a lot of concern for early adopter uh, or people who don't want to be early adopters. And then on the other side, we need to really understand how it changes or affects the operations of the car wash. And so if we understand the operation, uh, then we can actually put those together and now we have a business in a box. So now then we have the choice, do we want to go franchise model and say all you need to do is find a piece of land that hits these check boxes and we can give you a McDonald's uh, or we could operate it ourselves. Um, and then we can also provide it as like a hardware as a service or robotics as a service to big fleets which don't know how to run a car wash, but they would want car washing, and so we can run on their behalf. But in order to do all of that and commit to those kind of deals, we really need to understand the unit economics. And is, is part of the value proposition to have lower delivered cost at the end of the day so that they can charge less than a traditional car wash? Or Actually, is there, there a different value prop? It, it's, well, they, ha they would have the option to charge less if they want to, but margins are insanely high right now for car wash operators when you buy a car wash. So I'm just going to tell you guys, if you, say, if, you, <laughs> if you pay $29 for a monthly unlimited subscription, you need to wash like 15 times before it even starts to touch like making them lose money. So they make a lot of money off of car washes now. And so what's really attractive is we've talked to a lot of customers that are at self-serves or in-base. Like I literally said, I'll, I'll pay for your car wash if you answer some questions. Uh, and they're really willing to pay more for something that's environmentally friendly, is faster, more customized to them. I can't go into a car wash with a roof rack on a pickup truck with a tow hitch and like a tool chest in the back. But you go to our system, we know exactly what it is. So we'll go around the roof track. We won't touch the pickup bed if you don't want to. And we can also wash the you know, boat on the back of the car if it fits. So it gives owners a lot more option in terms of how much more they can tar charge per ticket, how much more they can reduce to be competition who doesn't have a plover system. And then it also allows for more market capture for different vehicles and different customers. Just awesome. How long does the 3D scan take? So right now, it takes about 15 seconds. And, right, and we're actually working with a couple of LiDAR companies. Uh, and we see a way to get this scan down to like two seconds. Uh, but right now, like that system, it's 15 seconds. And that's included in the wash time, which happens to be all in less than the current system is out there today. So, um, Is there a risk of the robot hitting a car due to an error? How would you handle liability? So the good question, there's two sides. So right now, one of the big things is customers uh, hitting equipment because customers will do whatever you can imagine and more. Uh, so for that one, that's standard. You have insurance for that. And also, our system is, has an option to have legs, but really it's uh, installed on the walls unless you don't want, uh, the owner doesn't want walls. And so in that case, there's nothing to run into except for the building itself. And our system is always retracted up and away. And so if your car can enter the bay and the system, then it won't be able to hit the system and if the cu customer decides to move while it's washing, our system's always looking at the car. So it will detect when it's moving, when it shouldn't be. And it can move at much faster speeds and acceleration than a Tesla with the you know, insane mode could from stopping. So our system's capable of avoiding things. But I'm not going to say we will never have an incident because customers are customers. <laughs> so. Yes, they are. Don't, yeah. yeah, don't say that. Um, how much would a home <laughs> unit cost? <laughs> Oh, great question. Asking for a friend. Uh, right now, home unit is not for sale, only because of like it's very different to be in a residential house. Like now, your house could be damaged if certain things happen, and while it might not be our fault, we need to make sure all those things are thought through. Um, but it wouldn't. It would. I would say it's going to be less than what a commercial system would be if and when we ever actually did this. 
because it doesn't have to cover every base. It doesn't have to be you know, able to wash like you know, 150 cars a day for you know, 10 years. So it's really, it would cost significantly less, but it would also be a bit later. <laughs> and the next question is, what type of chemicals do you use so they don't damage the vehicles? Are they natural mm, or organic? Yeah, so we do not allow hydrofluoric acid. Uh, hydrofluoric acid or its uh, very related chemicals. So actually in the industry right now, because they know HF is so bad, they will actually say something is not HF because they're actually a mixture of precursors to HF. And as soon as it actually gets on the car, it turns into HF. And so we don't allow any use of HF or any HF kind of hidden precursor stuff. And so that can sufficiently wash because our system can control temperature, pressure, speed, all of those different things, the approach angle, impact force. So by current system can't do that. So you compensate with aggressive chemicals. Our system doesn't need that. And so eventually we could even eliminate chemicals uh, once we have the precision down to that point. That's beautiful. And then is there a solution for drying the vehicle? Uh, there is in the works, but as of today, uh, current standard practice is there are offboard dryers and onboard dryers. And so offboard dryers, our system works completely fine with those. And then we do have our own drying solution. The only hint I'll give is think of a dice and hand dryer, except since we can contour around the surface, we can do it that way. Very cool. Yeah. So this question says, I go through the car wash with my nine-year-old son, and we put on the music really loud. Any intention to connect the wash <laughs> to music? I really want to know who asked that, because that's like my, that's the number one thing in my, when we're done with the things that actually matter for washing a car, and we can go into the show, that's like one of the first things I want to do. So yes, we can do that. It's just that we are in the process of hiring two more software engineers, so we have the bandwidth to do that. Uh, and so I'll say, just in a little bit of time, that will be a thing. Very good. And so your system is only, let me just um, clarify, only for like this, the bay um, pull in one car at a time, or can you actually handle the like more conveyor belt style? Uh, so conveyor belt style is not what our system is designed to fit in. However, we actually have a, a lot of demand to get a solution that would work for conveyor. So actually, Lance at Brown Bear has been also asking us, like, could you make this custom thing for my tunnel? Um, but it's because tunnels have been such the kind of money maker or cash cow uh, because of the throughput. So throughput is an important thing in car washes. How many cars can you get through uh, in a given time? And in -bay automatics have been too slow to do that. But our system has the ability to beat even four minutes, which starts to compete in tunnels. So one path is we could look at a tunnel so type of solution or conveyor type of solution, which would be more like a robotic car manufacturing production line. But you can imagine that's going to have way more cost. Um, so that might be way down the line when we see that our system isn't enough to really get the throughput. But right now, we see that our system itself, if you have two or three of them, it costs less than a tunnel, which is even bigger. And that our system with two or three could beat a tunnel of equivalent size or bigger. That makes sense. Yeah. So, Pulver, you said that Lance and Craig want five units. Do you have any actual POs yet? Yeah. So, Craig, that PO is under legal review, and we expect him to sign on Monday. That's done. Uh, and he's already committed a non-refundable deposit, 20%. And same with Lance. Uh, so, his final check is he's bringing uh, seven of his executive staff members to visit us uh, in a couple of weeks. And so, that's when we expect to get the signature for that one. Um, so, yeah. Amazing. Congratulations. What are your margins? What are our margins? Gross margin is 60% based off of a conservative one-off prototype bomb. So we expect that margin to go up significantly once we're at volume. And can I ask a quick related question? On, on for course. servicing and supporting the equipment in the field, are you charging to do that yourselves? Are you outsourcing the It's a little bit of a combination. Um, I think eventually, in the very long run, it will become something that we have in-house completely. But for now, both because you know, John Keevy has done so much more. He knows how these sites are set up and operated. So we're working, we split up a little bit of it. So we're basically coaching John and his team and other companies like John's um, to be able to handle a lot of the pre-prep work. And distribution uh, partners are really important for car wash owners. It's like the trust, kind of like, you know, truckers like, you know, trust, farmers like trust. It's car washing is very similar. So we'll start with a hybrid. Um, and we'll obviously take care of all the software, firmware, and advanced robotics and controls part. Um, but most all of that can be done remotely. So it's really the install work that will be a little bit collaborative. And uh, any kind of nozzle replacement or very, very easy stuff, it makes more sense for the guy next door to you to do it. So, Got it. Makes sense. Very good. And why did you name it Plover? Oh, I love this. OK. <laughs> so Plover is named after the Egyptian Plover bird, also known as the crocodile bird, because they clean crocodile's teeth. And we put the water droplet here for Plover, get a car wash. And the bird's actually three water droplets. <laughs>
and we did not hire a designer for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That was just a weekend of really creative drinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's just great. Um, any any follow up from you, Eric? Anything else you're dying to know? No, it sounds like you figured out where the car wash owners are because whenever you go to these car washes, they're never there. But you found them <laughs> oh, at the round I'm, table. You don't, yeah, don't ask me how. I, I'm really good at stalking people. So <laughs> all, their, all their info is available online. Yeah. And um, to be frank, a lot of the car wash industry, they're not the most tech savvy. Like they might be car wash savvy, but not tech savvy. So, you know, you know better than to put your cell phone on public records, but a lot of car wash owners don't, so. <laughs> wow, I love that. Well, well done. This is a great idea, and it's wonderful so to much. have you here. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, Andrew. And now we're going to hear from BBC fund sponsor Elevate Capital. My name is Nitin Rai. I'm a managing partner of Elevate Capital, and I'm also president of Thai Oregon and chair of Thai Angels. We invest in really early stage uh, companies that are in tech and healthcare, as well as consumer product. So Elevate's thematic approach is to invest in women, minorities, uh, people of color, BIPOC entrepreneurs. And in fund one, uh, which was a $10 million fund, we made 29 investments. And off those, we had two exits within three years. And we anticipate some more exits in the next few years that will show, prove our thesis that underserved entrepreneurs outperform. We've taken a lot of the learnings from Fund One uh, into Fund Two, which is investing in the entrepreneur. We feel that our mentor capitalism is our secret sauce. So we bring in all this experience, operator-led experience, to support these entrepreneurs. And these entrepreneurs don't just need the money, they also need the coaching and the guidance. So that's what we provide alongside our capital. We are very intentional about supporting the BIPOC entrepreneurs. Uh, that includes Black, Latinx, Indigenous people, because these entrepreneurs have been overlooked for a very long time. These communities have been overlooked and underserved for a very long time, and they need our help. And what we offer to these folks is not just our capital, but as I said earlier, our mentoring and our network, and we open up our network to them. And what we want to help them with is create generational wealth so that then they can go and repeat this into their communities. And that's really the core mission of Elevate, is to elevate these communities and help support create generational wealth. You know, we're really excited to support uh, BBC this year, and I wanna wish all the companies that are presenting, which are all great companies presenting this year, I wish them the best of luck, and congratulations, Edco and BBC, for another great conference. Thank you, Nitin and Elevate. We can't wait to see what Fund 2 does for these BBC finalists in the coming months after closing. Eric? Yeah, thanks, Shannon. Uh, you may have heard that the plumbing industry is not actually as glamorous uh, well, as the porn industry claims it to be. Um, but you might be surprised what we're about to hear. Uh, this company is going to join us from Seattle. It's our next presenter for the growth stage, and they're creating software that automates the cutting of industrial steel pipe for construction and industrial uses. And so please join me in uh, welcoming Pipe Server CEO David Basigi. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. I was going to make a joke about being a, you know, a, a blockchain, AI, hybrid, you know, pipe offering, but uh, uh, we'll just go right to it. So, um, so Pipe Server, whoops, here we go. Uh, pipe Server is, uh, is a software uh, uh, product that's designed to streamline the workflow in industrial construction. Uh, this, uh, there's a tremendous amount of pain here. Uh, construction industry has had three decades of continuous decline in productivity. Um, the, you layer on top of that a, a skilled labor shortage, 
And the contractor's margins have, have been squeezed to the point where if there's one significant uh, problem on a project, they go into the red. And the reason for all this is because buildings have gotten more sophisticated, more complicated over the years, but the, the processes for building them have not changed fundamentally uh, in all this time. So there's a large appetite for automation and digitization of the shop floor. So what are we talking about here? Uh, the, the pipe cutting workflow as it's currently done uh, starts with a, uh, a design uh, typically done in, in CAD software or nowadays in building information modeling software or virtual building software uh, where large pipe structures are designed uh, to be uh, built, welded up out of uh, individually cut steel parts. And we're not talking about slicing a salami. This is, these are very sophisticated shapes. You can see an example there. That's a, uh, a joining piece for three different pipes that are coming in at different angles. Uh, the bevel angles are critical. The, the uh, junctions are critical. The cut quality is critical. If you don't get that right, your welders uh, are going to spend a lot of time grinding and filling. The quality of the joint is going to suffer. Uh, it's going to take time to, uh, to build the part. So um, what we do, or, or what, what the uh, shops do today, is they have to take those CAD designs and translate them, essentially redesign all those parts using the native language of their automated pipe cutting machines. So these pipe cutting machines have been around for 15 years, but they don't interact with any of the upstream or downstream processes. So all the CAD designs have to be essentially manually input to these machines. Then because these large pipes that, that are being cut up can be typically between 20 and 40 feet long, between two and a half inches in diameter and five feet in diameter and weigh thousands of pounds, you want to get as many parts cut out of a pipe as you possibly can in that one loading operation. Uh, so there's a process called nesting, where, the, where multiple parts are fit on the pipe optimally to minimize waste. But when you're doing it manually, it's hard to get that optimal, especially when you've got strange shapes like the one I've shown there. Then the parts are cut, and finally, inventory has to be updated. Uh, currently, that's done manually, if it's done at all, and is a very time-consuming and error-prone process. So at PipeServer, we completely automate this. Our software communicates uh, with all the upstream design packages our customers may use. Uh, currently over a dozen and growing. Uh, we take those designs, we translate them into the native machine language of whatever brand of pipe cutter that, that uh, customer has. There's no manual programming at all. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, we, we uh, cut the pipes and uh, generate uh, labels uh, which can be QR coded to link to cloud-based drawings and assembly instructions. Uh, we manage pipe inventory, part inventory, spool inventory, uh, and importantly, we send information back upstream to those building information modeling systems. So they know when a part has been cut, if a design has changed, they can catch it before it's cut, uh, or if it's already cut, they can, they can adapt elsewhere. So it really closes the loop on the entire digital workflow all the way through uh, production. So our customers consist of all the commercial uh, construction uh, shops uh, that are not doing residential construction. R pipe cutting is typically done by hand in residential construction, but anything commercial uh, is done you know, using these, these large pipe cutting machines. And there are thousands of pipe cutting machines uh, in the United States and around the world. Uh, just the American General Contractors Association uh, has 27,000 members, 20,000 of which are, are uh, uh, non-residential. Uh, we also have uh, uh, arrangements with the pipe cutting machine manufacturers. Uh, the largest one in the world is Lincoln Electric. We have a deal with Lincoln Electric. Our software is now standard on every pipe cutting machine that they make. Uh, we also have a similar deal with Mashatech Automation out of Canada. And our software is also optional on uh, HGG, which is the largest European manufacturer. Um, finally, we are uh, building a cloud B2B service for the pipe suppliers. Uh, the lead investor in our Series A round uh, is Ferguson Ventures, that's the corporate venture capital arm of Ferguson Enterprises, which is one of the largest pipe wholesaling companies uh, in the United States. So our revenue model is a hybrid. We 
uh, both sell software and the ongoing uh, recurring license fees for those softwares to the fabrication shops. Uh, typical upfront pricing is around $20,000 and then an average of about $4,000 a year per shop. We have 140 customers already and are, are growing quickly. Uh, we're also developing this B2B cloud service for the pipe suppliers. They want to be able to use pipe uh, pipe server to uh, enable the, the customers to purchase directly uh, from the pipe supplier as opposed to uh, going indirectly. They get a far more accurate order because we know exactly what that bomb should be because we've already done a virtual nesting. Uh, we, and we can also, uh, we're aware of all the accessories that get welded onto the pipe, which the pipe suppliers also sell. Uh, and also the suppliers want to climb the value chain. They don't want to just sell commodity raw pipe. They want to be able to custom cut parts for customers who don't have a machine or have a machine that's fully occupied or have a machine that can't handle the size of the pipe that they may need, may need for a particular job. So there's a lot of value added there. In terms of the value we, we provide to the shop, uh, it's actually quite straightforward to calculate. Uh, we have an ROI calculator right on our website. You punch in the amount of time you spend, uh, number of parts you, you produce. Um, and the real heavy hitter here is how much time the welders spend grinding and how much time the machine operators spend programming. Uh, typically, our average customer will pay for their uh, software in less than a year, and their annual fees are, are, uh, are far lower than the annual savings. Um, and we add capabilities and extend the useful life of their very large capital investment in their pipe cutter. Uh, so our growth drivers are cross-brand compatibility, our supply agreements, our geographic expansion worldwide and out of North America, and our extension to the supply chain, all of this has come online in the last year and multiplied our addressable market by about 25-fold. So in terms of management, uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. My training is actually in bioengineering. Uh, I started a company in, in uh, 1999 to build high-speed automated microscopes. We built several generations of technology. I established a, a worldwide sales and marketing force. Uh, and we ultimately sold that company to Millifor Sigma for $110 million in an all-cash deal. Uh, the co-founder of uh, Pipe Server is Kelly Dillon. Uh, Kelly's a, a, a virtuoso in making uh, the most of hardware uh, using software. He's got a background, uh, in management background at Boeing and Microsoft, uh, has developed a wide diversity of, of systems uh, that really push the cutting edge. And then our CFO was my CFO at Amnes, uh, Pat McDermott. Uh, he's got multiple exits to his credit and uh, extensive experience working with uh, various companies, large and small. Uh, and so with that, I'll thank you for your uh, attention and happily answer any questions. Thank you, David. That is just amazing. Well done. Thank you. Impressive. I'm going to let Eric take the first question. Yeah, who, who knew that the world lacked pipe cutting software? I'm with you. <laughs> no, it's, uh, no, and uh, it's, a, it's a great education. So thank you for going through all that. Um, I guess my, my question is, you talked a little bit about your background with, with the mic in the microscope world. Uh, what do you and your team bring to this market in terms of expertise, background, relationships um, that is unique and hard for anyone else to replicate and gives you an unfair advantage in being successful right. with this? Well, I'll start with Kelly because he's the one who started the company. Um, the way Pipe Server started was a, a local machine manufacturer was looking for uh, software to, uh, to add to their machine uh, for basic control. They, they know how to weld machines together and attach motors, but they didn't know how to, how to control them. And so back in 2010, uh, uh, Kelly got together with them and, and uh, developed the basic machine operation software. But Kelly, he's a systems guy. And, uh, and he, so once he did that, that basic implementation um, and started getting exposure to the industry, uh, he realized that there was this much, much larger workflow problem. And uh, that the digitization stopped, you know, like a brick wall in the design office and never got down to the shop floor. So over the next uh, uh, two to three years, he developed uh, what he called the enterprise version of, of Pipe Server, which extends all the way up to the design studio and all the way down to the field uh, with the cloud enablement. So, um, you know, he brought that outside perspective. And, and I've always brought an outside perspective as well. My, my background is not in microscopy. It's actually in, in uh, uh, DNA sequencing and, and protein analysis. Um, but the Amnes company, the Amnes Corporation that I founded, uh, we were outsiders to the imaging world. And we were able to bring uh, a new perspective to it. And 
what was characteristic of, of uh, microscopy and flow cytometry at, is also characteristic of, of this industry, where, where you have a lot of, lot of large players, not a lot of innovation over the years, and a green field to come in and really turn things upside down. Yeah, it's interesting how sometimes the innovation has to come from outside where you can bring something from somewhere else and apply it to the industry. So yeah, it is sense. an interesting phenomenon, yeah. isn't it? Um, and uh, questions from the audience. Oh, wait, I'm waiting for questions. Um, what is, what have been, what's been your favorite thing about this process? What's been your kind of like most exciting development going through this? So um, I, I really, uh, the, the thing that's really gotten me most excited is, is making these deals with these large companies. You know, Lincoln is a, is a $3 billion revenue multinational corporation. Uh, you know, they're in the Fortune 500. They're publicly traded. They, uh, they're a powerhouse. And, uh, and we are a little team of six. And we were able to go in and, and show them how much value we could add to their platform and, and how much uh, uh, of a strategic fit it would be. And, and very, very rapidly, we're able to get this deal in place. And that, that's really a game changer for us. And I think it's going to be a game changer for them. And uh, you know, I, I like to flex different muscles in different contexts. Uh, Amnes was a technological thing, and then sales and marketing, and then my follow-on uh, position was the development of, of clinical instrumentation for, for healthcare. Uh, and we were able to come in and, and, and turn that upside down with a, with a platform that was twice as effective and twice as powerful and two-thirds the price of all the competitors. And, but I never did a lot of uh, business development uh, in either of those roles. To, to my satisfaction. And now this is a real business development play and, and I think we're, we're uh, very happy with how it's going. I love to hear that. Eric, looks like you have a question. Yeah, uh, the, some of the CAD and BIM suppliers like, like Trimble and Autodesk, you know, they're always looking for ways to capture more market share and add value. What prevents them, once they see you being successful, what prevents them from bundling their software on the pipe cutting machines themselves so um, pipe cutting is, a, uh, is, is the hardest thing to do on the shop floor. And there's some, some technical reasons for that. Uh, one of them is that uh, uh, it's not like traditional machining, where you can go and touch down on the part and say, this is the origin of my world, zero, zero, zero. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reference everything to that and make my part. With pipe, everything is referenced to an imaginary center line. There is no physical fiducial to, to, that you can touch. And uh, all the, every, every uh, uh, pipe part is, uh, um, you know, is referenced to an imaginary reference point. Um, the, the machine control is critical. And these machines are enormous. Um, with lots of moving mass and lots of acceleration and deceleration. And, but every time you, you jitter them, um, you get, a, you get a, something that needs to be ground in the weld. And that costs the company money because, because now you've got a welder doing this instead of welding at 30 bucks an hour unburdened, you know, it, it, it adds up fast. It's a minute per year, a, a minute per cut per welder is $15,000 a year in the shop. So, you know, these AutoCAD and Trimble and the like are very good at design software. Uh, their, their core competence is not in machine control and not in the mathematics of pipe cutting. And so we actually have a, 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 a relationship with Trimble. Uh, they had previously acquired a company called Camduct that was sort of an, an analog of pipe server, but in the duct world. So they automated the manufacture of, of ducting. And uh, we're discussing our, you know, our future with Trimble uh, as a, a similar kind of uh, uh, yeah, very expansion. Cool. That makes of that. sense. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a fun audience question. Have you considered expansion to the UAE? Dubai would be such a great hub for you. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, so Lincoln Electric is our channel to the, to the Middle East and to other parts of the world. Uh, uh, they are, uh, they're sort of the IBM of, of, uh, of, of this space in that you know, they're the safe choice. Nobody ever got fired for them. Their machines never die. They, they never go down. They're incredibly robust. And so uh, if you have a, essentially a, a factory operation, uh, like uh, energy you know, uh, uh, drilling or, or offshore rig development or what have you, uh, they cannot go down. There's too much uh, cost associated with downtime. Uh, co construction's a little more flexible, but uh, uh, those kinds of industries, they go with Lincoln. And uh, so we will be in Dubai next year. I, awesome, I, I love to hear that. That's so, yeah. that's so exciting. What does competition look like in your market? So there are uh, three other companies out there uh, 
Um, uh, the big, biggest two are Sigma Tech and uh, Alma. Um, and the, all three of them, uh, the third one is Hypertherm, which is a, also a, a steel cutting torch manufacturer. Um, all three of them specialize in plate cutting, flat steel cutting, which is a two-dimensional math problem, uh, and thin wall tube cutting, where you don't have bevels and, and things like that that are, that are critical to the job. They're much simpler tasks. Um, and so uh, their hurdle to getting into pipe cutting is higher than our hurdle to getting into flat and tube. Uh, so we're actually going to use, our plan is to use the pipe cutter as a Trojan horse uh, and expand out to the, uh, to the other machines in the shop. Initially, the chop saws, uh, there's a company called uh, Tiger Stop in Portland uh, that makes uh, machines like this that simply position material and then chop it and position it and chop it, um, that's a natural fit for an extension to pipe server. Once we've got the server in the shop, we can sell at $1,000 a year a license to, uh, to run the other tools in the, in the shop as well. And, and it puts a big boost in our recurring revenues. That's wonderful. Is this process service going to expand to other CAM processes? So yes. sounds like, yeah. In fact, uh, Lincoln Electric and Mashatech both have very large businesses in flat cutting as well uh, and are eager to work with us to port our software to those platforms. So again, it's, it's that Trojan horse uh, strategy uh, where once we get in on pipe, we can move to the tables, we can move to the, to the saws, and uh, really what we want to be is the operating system for the shop floor. We want to we take that digital world and bring it all the way down, uh, even to the manual saws, where we're not actually controlling the motion of the tool, but uh, it's pulled into the workflow. So uh, we print a label, it has instructions, it says cut this part 16 inches, put this label on it, it's QR coded, it's back to the drawings, it's got all the status updates, and now their entire process is digitized. I think you've, you've started to address this, but we'll, we'll see. Your sales seem related to sales of machines. How do you grow when machine sales are slow? So um, we, there, there are two, two avenues there. One is uh, we're on the new machines uh, through our business development efforts. Uh, so we're OEM suppliers to both Mashatech and Lincoln. Uh, so all the new machines that are sold are gonna, gonna be automatically bundled with pipe server. But there's a, there's a uh, multi-thousand installed base of machines out there already that are not running pipe server. And uh, so we're gonna be pursuing those. Our agreement with Lincoln also covers their installed base. So we have access to their, uh, their entire customer base. Uh, they support us by uh, uh, going in and doing preventative maintenance uh, before we install pipe server to, to guarantee a, a more successful install. So that when, when uh, Lincoln and pipe server leave that site, uh, it's like they have a new machine, new capabilities, like new performance, and, and so on. So it's a, uh, that's going to be our, our low-hanging fruit for next year. That's very cool. Um, so as a seasoned entrepreneur, do you have just a few words for what your biggest advice would be for growth stage founders? Uh, focus. Focus. That's the hardest part. Focus. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. Well, David, really well done. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It's wonderful to have you here today. Thanks, David. What, a, what a, an interesting, fascinating education, and uh, congrats on all you're doing. It sounds like a, a nice solution. And I think what we're seeing today, these companies are solving really, really hard problems. And the next company up today, I think, is solving one of the most intractable problems that, that many of us have faced, and that is, how do you make paying your medical bills a delightful experience? Right? I mean, how hard? <laughs> it doesn't get any harder than that. And so today, joining us from Phoenix is RexPay, a mobile app where patients can easily understand, manage, and pay all their medical bills and track insurance information in one place. So please join me in welcoming CEO Rachel Mertensmeyer. Hello, thank you so much for having us today. It's an honor to speak with you and share with you about RexPay. RexPay is a mobile app that helps healthcare patients to understand, manage, and pay all of their medical bills in one place. My name is Rachel Mertensmeyer, and I am the CEO and founder of RexPay. I started RexPay because in 2016, I had a very severe injury, which led to over 38 medical bills across 11 different providers and over $10,000 in personal medical debt. And so I'm sure many of you can relate to this moment 
where I was sitting with bills in front of me. I was feeling confused by what the medical bills meant, um, when the due date actually was, how much I really owed. I was frustrated by the fragmentation of having to pay bills across multiple payment methods and different portals with logins that I couldn't remember. And I was disappointed at the lack of visibility to the safe financing options that existed in the healthcare system, but that I wasn't made aware of. And so like 45% of millennial patients, I put that medical debt on credit cards, which created a severe problem for me. And so these patient pain points of confusion, fragmentation, and lack of visibility to financing causes a serious problem for healthcare systems and providers as well. They're losing billions of dollars every year on defaulted patient payments. And they have rising overhead costs that they're managing related to becoming a collections agency as patient pay rises. So let's look at a case study with a customer that's in our pipeline today. This healthcare system told us that they're losing 10% of their $6 billion top line um, every year, and that's increasing 3% for them year over year. And they said that if we could even impact that by 5%, that would make a huge difference for them. What we're seeing for our customers today is that we were able to help them reduce their outstanding debt payments by 10% in less than six weeks. And so this problem is not going away. Analysts are projecting that this will continue to rise in terms of the patient becoming the payer of healthcare by 5% year over year. And already today, healthcare systems are facing up to 30% of their revenue being reliant on patient payments. So RexPay is solving this problem by first addressing confusion, by helping patients understand their medical bills and how it relates to their insurance. Second, we're helping solve the fragmentation problem by helping patients see all of their healthcare bills and their financial data points like their remaining deductible all in one place and enables them to pay every single provider and any provider in the United States in one app. We also bring visibility to financing plans that are available from the provider or a safe financing option when we're partnered with the provider. So this is live today in the iOS and Android app store. We have two patents pending on our technology, which enables the OCR to recognize any medical bill in any format. Our AI powered chatbot is answering 650 of the most common medical billing and insurance related questions today. And of course, we are also HIPAA compliant. And in addition to that, our backend has the capability to both send and receive data instantaneously with healthcare systems, um, EHR and billing system backends. So our first customer base is the healthcare system. We help them save money, um, increase efficiency and increase patient satisfaction. And we're reaching these customers through three methods currently today. One is through our partnership with the Athena Marketplace, which gives us an instant API connection with 160,000 providers across the United States. The second is with our partner, Access One, which we're currently rolling out a partnership with them. And they have 230 existing hospital facilities that they're interested in rolling us out in. And we've already identified six healthcare systems that they're planning to roll us out in in Q1 2021. We're also working with Richard Bowles, who has 15 years of experience being the CEO um, most recently of Blue Cross Blue Shield Arizona. And so he's making introductions in the Southwest to CEOs of healthcare systems for us. So once we acquire the customer, how do we get them onto the app? Well, we have full control of patient communication. And we communicate across text, email, and push notification directly to patients to onboard them to the app and to make them aware of their bills and financing options. We make it super easy for them. So we see 90% of installation to profile completion. And once a patient has an account, they can pay their bill in six seconds with just three taps. 
Also, it's important to note again that patients can pay all of their providers with RexPay, not only the provider that we're partnered with. And we know that 90% of patients want a place to pay all of their providers in one place. And this is currently not being met efficiently in the market today. This is causing great results for our existing customers. We're helping them get paid two times faster than their previous solution of paying through a standard portal. And 30% of bills are paid within five days, even before a paper statement reaches the patient. Our revenue model is a transaction-based model. When a patient pays a partner provider, the partner provider pays us a 1.5% transaction fee, and we do have a $200 monthly minimum fee. When a patient pays a non-partner provider, there is a convenience fee of 1% with a $5 cap per transaction. This is a very um, large opportunity. It's a large market. $400 billion is spent every year by patients on their own out-of-pocket healthcare costs. And that is rising 5% year over year. This is our projection of where we see ourselves going. And this is fairly conservative considering our Access One and some other distribution partnerships that we have in the pipeline. But currently what you see is that it, it really depends a lot on the size of customer that we're bringing on. So if we have um, even 20% more of the enterprise customers, then we need a lot less of the mid-sized customers. And that's how um, our revenue scales with customers and then patients and then bills. That's how it's built out. So currently today we have 2,500 patients live. We have two practices live today and that's where we've been starting to see some of these great results coming in. We have a partnership with Change Healthcare which enables us to connect to 80% of insurance plans across the United States today. And we have a partnership with the Athena Marketplace, which I mentioned before, gives us the ability to go live in two weeks with a pre-existing API with 160,000 providers across the United States. My background is primarily in Fortune 100 companies. I've worked in management globally in Shanghai and New York and San Francisco. Um, I've managed multi-billion dollar uh, brands, million, multi-million dollar budgets, and primarily focused on consumer innovation and product development. We also have a very strong team, as you can see, with both strong enterprise and consumer-based um, product development experience. And we also have experts who really understand the healthcare industry and the patient pay industry on our team as well. Furthermore, this is just a sampling of the investors and advisors that we have on our team who are actively engaging with us. They have sub-task force committees, they meet regularly with us, and they're opening doors across the healthcare industry. And several of them have built and exited successful healthcare tech and payments companies. Thank you so much, and I'm really excited to answer any questions that you have and share with you more about the opportunity of RexPay and how we're helping solve medical bill mayhem for patients and providers. Rachel, I just want to start by saying thank you. This is a remarkable development for pedestrians paying bills. I'm, Eric, I'll let you take it away, but this is, yeah. this is mind blowing. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it too. And I also wish that uh, you could send annoying repeated emails to my insurance company until they pay their part of the bill, <laughs> which is often part of the problem. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how you get insurance companies to reveal what they're really supposed to pay, not just what they want to pay, and give the consumer confidence that the insurance company has really paid what they're obligated to pay before you pay out of pocket. Great question, Eric. Absolutely, so currently today, um, we don't bring in explanation of benefit information directly into the app. That's actually in our product pipeline and our partner chain healthcare has an API interface working on, which will enable us to roll that out next year. So currently what we do in terms of helping patients understand um, their explanation of benefits is that we prevent them from confusing it with a bill. So our OCR scanning technology will recognize an explanation of benefits and alert the patient that this is not a bill and educate them 
about what an explanation of benefits is. We also bring visibility to the remaining deductible and out-of-pocket cash maps that the patient has right in the dashboard, which also helps answer the question, why do I owe money on this bill? So in terms of a claim tracking status to understand, is this bill ready to pay or not? And how does this relate to how much the insurance company paid? That is a coming soon feature that we already have in the works with our partner, Change Healthcare. Excellent. So is there a module for actual healthcare delivery? Like can your app integrate with telehealth services? We have recently been approached um, by a telehealth company who's interested in partnering with us to explore that opportunity. Um, but we are currently not offering telehealth services today. Very good. Uh, what happens to your solution if the US moves to universal health care like other first world countries have successfully done? So That's a little. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a fabulous question. So today, the current policies that are most likely to pass um, within the next 10 years or so um, still have out-of-pocket costs for patients. So if you think about Medicare today, we actually have quite a few Medicare users on our platform because even Medicare users still have out-of-pocket costs. So even if a universal healthcare coverage Medicare for all policy was passed, there would still be a need for RexPay in terms of consolidating all of your medical bills and managing your healthcare finances. What would change primarily is that a lot of those surprise bills that cause some people to have a quarter million dollars in debt overnight, which by the way, we do have a few users who are managing that kind of debt on our platform, um, that would be what would change. And that's, that would be fantastic for those patients. It maybe, certainly would. Go ahead, Eric. Maybe I could ask a, a, a question. Um, so most hospital systems and clinics uh, contract with a revenue cycle management firm that does collections from patients, among other tasks. Um, and so they're paying them. And would they be paying you on top of that or instead of? Or how would you work with the revenue cycle management companies? So the way that it works is that we are offered as an add-on option if there's an existing revenue cycle process in place. However, the fees do not overlap. So the healthcare system would either be paying the revenue cycle management company if the patient paid through one of their systems, or they would be paying RexPay. And essentially what it means is that the healthcare system can offer optionality to their patients. And there is a very specific use case which RexPay solves for, which is patients who are families or patients with chronic conditions, patients who have a serious illness and are seeing a proliferation of bills. So those are really the patients that we are solving for. And currently today, we're capturing about 28% of the patient base in our existing customers. So we work very well alongside the existing Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Are you, and are you thinking of a loyalty program someday, or you, you pay your bill on time and earn points toward a free pancreas or something? <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of ideas around rewarding patients and providing incentives and payment in the app that are really exciting ideas in the future. Great. Okay. <laughs> so, how do you prevent others from copying you, but with more funding and competing with what you're doing? Well, firstly, we do have uh, two patents pending on our core technology, which enables us to recognize any medical bill in any format and also enables us to help the patient pay any doctor in the United States. So, of course, that's one area is IP. Um, also, it's really a speed to market question. So, currently in the market, our competitors are not focused on the manage all of your bills in one place problem. Also, most of our competitors are frenemies where, like we mentioned earlier, we can actually offer our solution alongside what they're offering. So most likely what will happen is um, one of those companies would approach us for acquisition before they would decide to try to build that technology themselves. 
And <laughs> why a dog name and in the logo, any confusion with pet insurance? Sure. So in the very beginning of RexPay, um, before we started any product design, I personally interviewed over 200 patients. And there was a theme throughout those interviews of patients describing a traumatic experience. They were saying that they felt like they needed to be rescued. They felt like they were um, fearful of the bills. And one patient even compared it to um, second to the fear she had of dying from cancer. So there was a very emotional, visceral reaction that patients were having related to their bills, which really surprised me and shocked me. And so I realized that we needed to help patients get over that fear factor and that psychological block in order to have them engage with their bills productively. And that's why we came up with Rex Pay. Rex is the friendly rescue dog who rescues you from the medical bill avalanche. Um, and we have received very positive feedback from patients who say they never thought paying medical bills could be fun and that they never want to pay medical bills any other way. And I really believe that the brand is a significant part of that. Oh, that's just genius. I personally think dogs are the best part of life, so this makes sense. You're very smart to go that direction. Um, do we have another audience question for Rachel? Maybe not. Harold, how about anything else from you, Eric? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear um, what you're learning from the, the user experience. For example, are uh, some of the, the patients just doing call blocking and say, I just don't want to receive those texts? Um, or what are they receptive and, and what kind of the behavioral learnings? So we, in terms of um, patients giving feedback on how they'd like to be communicated with, we have received some requests from patients, um, pretty minimal overall in terms of um, overall percent of communication. But we have received a few requests from patients saying, please do not text me. Um, from the data, we see that once they have an account, push notifications are less invasive and the most effective way to communicate with, with your users. Um, push notifications are actually seven times more effective than email. And so that's why we primarily communicate via push notification for our existing users. And we are working on features that will enable customization in their profile so that patients will be able to customize how they would like us to engage with them moving forward. That makes sense. What's been the most surprising part of this for you? I think the most surprising part of this for me was realizing what a significant problem this is for healthcare systems and providers, as well as for patients. Because I started this company um, really being spurred out of a personal experience with medical bills as a patient. And as I started to get into the industry and I realized that this was a um, 50 billion plus loss for hospitals alone every year and, and increasing year over year. Um, that was very surprising to me. And I think in some sense, it's actually positive because it means that everyone is incentivized together to solve this problem and help patients. Absolutely, that surprised me as well. And um, it does help humanize those big those big medical companies too. So, well, thank you so much for what you're doing and I wish you the best of luck, Rachel. It's wonderful to hear from you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Good luck to all the other presenters. Thanks, Rachel. So there are two industries I know of that refer to their customers as users. Anyone have a guess? Software is one. Illegal drugs is the other. So that's what's coming up next. Now, we don't have illegal drugs, um, but we do have junkies. We have accessory junkies and software all together. So I want you to welcome Michelle Reeves, who is the co-founder and CEO of Access The Accessory Junkie. And she's joining us from Portland. They are pioneering a new e-commerce model that connects customers with hard-to-find products, from all around the world. Please join me in welcoming Michelle. 
Great, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Michelle Reeves, co-founder and CEO of The Accessory Junkie. Thank you for having me here. We are gathered here today to say farewell to traditional retail. Farewell Barneys and those who suffer low margins. Goodbye Forever 21 and that mountain of fast fashion that customers have turned their backs on. And good luck to you, dear retailers, who face a never-ending spiral of discounts because of the high rate of product returns. There is a diverse world of fashion out there. So why are our closets filled with the same factory-made commodities? Look at that clutch. Doesn't it feel incredible when someone stops to compliment your style and ask, where is that from? And yet, it is wholly unrewarding to reply back, I got it at Zara. Wouldn't it feel great to say things like, this clutch was hand painted in Iceland. This ring is from Brazil or Japan. If only there were an easy way to shop the world. Or better yet, have the world come to you. Well, that's the problem. Limited edition fashion is in high demand, yet it is hard to find reserved for the elite and expensive to own. Traditional retail may be dying, but a new model of retail is rising. Welcome to the Accessory Junkie. We give customers access to unique and limited edition fashion accessories from around the world. Necklaces from Rome, bags from Copenhagen, earrings from Sydney and beyond. We're pioneering a new model in the $300 billion accessories industry. Accessories, low cost, high margin, and unlike fashion apparel, it doesn't face the same restrictions of sizing and seasonality. Our model is based on curation, not creation. We don't manufacture anything. Instead, we curate the best of what's already out there from independent designers. And in doing so, we're empowering a new global supply chain that gives customers access to an endless flow of scarcity. Straight from designer studios, each piece is made ethically using locally sourced materials. Every item we sell is 100% traceable. And these designers, they're tired of being left to fend for themselves in overcrowded online marketplaces like Etsy. Did you know that for a designer in Europe to find a new customer in the US using Etsy, they have a 0.0000004% chance of that happening. We curate from the huge yet highly fragmented 33 million independent designers worldwide. How do we find them? We're building a global network of curators these curators are local fashion writers, editors, and stylists who have deep local knowledge of their market. They have a unique eye for product, and they are incredible storytellers, which fuels our content and marketing. To date, we have over 350 designers from six continents, and we're in discussions with more uh, writers and editors from Vogue and other notable media platforms. Our customers become fanatics. For as little as $50, they can own premium limited edition items that they can't find themselves and won't see on anyone else. We're building the future of retail where every customer can be a global insider, where they can shop unique items with ease and confidence. And instead of contributing to landfill, our model actively reduces the world's reliance on fashion factories. We've served over 5,000 happy customers, and we've learned a lot. We know that our first time customers on e-commerce will spend $128 with us, while our first time customers on chat commerce will spend over 300. We're a little bit obsessed with consumer behavior. That's why we've tested multiple direct-to-consumer strategies across multiple platforms. And collectively, we've done this for 60 weeks and driven $700,000 in revenue. But that's just the tip of the iceberg in an industry where consumers are spending 
$821 million every single day. Our model outperforms traditional retail metrics. We've solved some of retail's biggest pain points, margins, where traditional retailers are struggling to maintain a 45 to 55% margin, we're at 71%. And how about those product returns? Can you believe that 28% of everything they sell is returned? We're at less than 2%. While we're primarily a direct-to-consumer model, we have become a back-end solution to traditional retailers like Nordstrom. Nordstrom can't do what we do. That's why they asked us to do it for them. And they saw the same high-performing metrics we see. Happy customers, fast sell-through, and low returns. In a year where Nordstrom has cut 40% of their vendors, they're not just doubling down with us, they're increasing our business relationship 10x. And it's not just our metrics they love, it's our innovation as well. We recently launched augmented reality for virtual try-on. Yes, all these customers are virtually trying on earrings from around the world. And Nordstrom shared with us that they've been asking major brands for the past two years to do this. We are the first. Welcome to the future of uh, retail. It is so exciting. We call it scaling scarcity. And internally, ref we refer to it as Tinder for retail. An endless flow of scarcity in the palm of your hand, where our curators around the world are unlocking, live streaming, and personalizing a feed just for you. Don't like something in your feed? Swipe left, you'll never see it again. Swipe right, and you'll have a limited amount of time to make it yours. Gamification, matchmaking, storytelling all collide in the future of commerce. A top line look at our financials shows that on our roadmap to a billion dollars, curators are the key to our scale, where each curator drives 1.4 million in revenue. And by the time we get to 400 curators, we'll be just over 1.1 billion in revenue. Our projections for the next four years shows a strong and steady growth. By 2024, we'll be at just over 70 million in revenue. And there's another exciting number, which is the $30 million that we would have diverted away from fashion factories at this point. Instead, those dollars will have gone to support independent designers, the majority of whom are women and people of color. We're the right team to build this. I have over 20 years in retail sports and entertainment. I'm obsessed with innovation, which is why I created the world's first touch trademark for another company I started. My co-founder, Andrea, is our chief product officer. She has experience on almost every continent, working with hundreds of designers. And we have an all-star team of advisors, the first of whom is Randy Zuckerberg. She created Facebook Live. Before she was an investor and an advisor, she was a customer. And there's no greater testament than when a customer emails and says, you have to let me know when you're fundraising, I want to invest. We're excited for what the future holds. It's time to overhaul this overlooked category. Thank you for your time, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Michelle. I loved your pitch. Eric, what is your first question for, for Michelle? Yeah, that was fabulous, Michelle. A great presentation, and I love, you know, I love what you're doing. You know, people spend trillions trying to look cool every day, and, and for some it works, and for the rest of us it doesn't. Um, <laughs> And I love, love the name, the accessory junkie, the Tinder analogy. And um, I think it's just really clever what you're doing. And uh, maybe you could sell earrings from reformed poppy farmers in Afghanistan. That'd be a pretty cool story <laughs> for the accessory junkie. Um, but I, I want to ask a question about the scalability of the business. When you are doing small batch unique items um, that are you want to you know, explicitly that are rare and short supply. How do you scale that into, into a large business? Absolutely. Um, I'll give you some, a real-time example. Um, so, for example, the Nordstrom relationship we have, this time last year we were doing 15000 a month with them. We're now doing 150000 a month, month with them. They're seeing that going wider in SKUs and going shallower is actually much more cost-effective they don't sit on the inventory for as long, they don't have to discount, and the sell-throughs are much faster. So from a business perspective in the modeling, 
having more SKUs and fewer of them is far more lucrative. Uh, in terms of scaling and meeting our consumer demand, uh, we traditionally have uh, taken inventory on board, but as we scale and grow, we are now doing a pre-order model. So consumers get to see all of the SKUs, they get to see the offering, but they know they have to act fast and have a limited amount of time to put that order in. So we, only the products that are ordered are the products that are produced. Um, and that's able to meet the demand and keep this feeling and notion of limited availability. Well, I know that you're addressing some very real problems that needed addressing in retail, but how how was this your, your business growth affected by what happened with COVID? On the supply chain side, we've seen that really strengthen. Uh, we were hoping to hit 350 designers by the end of this year. We hit that goal in July, so five months early. We're really seeing that there is such a missed opportunity and a high need for independent designers. Etsy is not meeting their needs. They're lost, as I mentioned before. And with the closures and the impact of COVID, their other lifeline for business of working with local boutiques and retailers has been completely cut off. So the inbound interest we're getting is really high from designers who want to be uh, noticed, they want to be uh, put in, the, in front of new customers and not feel so lost. They're very talented in their craft and their work. They're not savvy business professionals. So with COVID, that impact has really cut off a big part of their revenue stream and we're now a great answer to that for them. That makes sense. So how do you compensate curators? Uh, in two ways. So much like uh, freelance writing that they've done before, there's uh, a fee for a six week or uh, four week uh, contract that we have with them. And then they're incentivized through commissions. So the better the products they find and the better they sell and perform, the more they are compensated through commissions. Very good. How do you vet products and curators to keep mass-produced, counterfeit, or fast fashion products out of your distribution stream? Because the curators are local and content and storytelling is such a, a high converting uh, tool in any of our marketing, we see the story. We know who these designers are. When we, when we talk about 100% traceability, we also are talking about 100% accountability. These designers have a name, that these stories come from actual places with real content and photography. So we can see in real time the pieces as they are being made and can be kept up to date with those ethical and sustainable standards. Can you, can you talk a little more about the accountability and traceability you know, that's, you know, that you can guarantee? Because my sense is consumers are becoming jaded, you know, that it, there's a story behind every product, but it was actually made in, in, in China. Um, you know, how do they know that it's truly made by a, a Somali war widow or some lady in Redmond in her basement? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we now have exclusive relationships with these independent designers, and we can tell more of their story. So sharing the story of each piece through the collections we launch online, as well as through the app. Uh, consumers have varying levels of interest for how deep they want to go with the story, but our goal is to pr provide the full story for each piece. And can you tell us the story behind this fantastic necklace you're wearing right now? <laughs> oh, I can, thank you. So this actually is from Brazil. It's an incredible female designer, and she has this wonderful geometric futuristic look to it. We recently just launched um, a Ruth Bader Ginsburg collection. Um, the news of her passing, I think, hit a lot of women hard, particularly knowing all the work she's done for women who can work and didn't have to choose between having a family or working, but could do both. So we reached out to some of our favorite female designers around the world, and uh, her name is Gisa, and she was one of them. And we sold a limited number of these with a, an artwork of our uh, RBG uh, wearing this necklace uh, with her. So it felt powerful to channel a little of, of Ruth today. Absolutely. And, uh, and I think feel connected to other women around the world. You know, I'm from Australia originally, and in hearing from our customers, everyone has a link somewhere else in the world. And it feels really powerful when they find a piece that's from where their family is from or where they've honeymooned or visited. And that sentimental value is I think really powerful and unique in accessories, 
you don't feel the same way about you know, your jeans or a dress as you do about a special pair of earrings or a necklace. Oh, it's so true. So on that note, what, what, have, what surprised you about this endeavor? What were some of the things that you couldn't have predicted? Uh, truly seeing the impact this has on the designers themselves. They've been so unsupported. And as we look to the future of, of what we can do, we can provide a model with structure that gives them marketing tools and financial tools to build a very robust business for themselves. And that local impact is more than just you know, a slogan or a really catchy phrase, as Eric had mentioned before. Customers do feel jaded because too many companies are saying sustainable without proving what that means. And this is real with real impact. And that feels so good on the back end, creating the business. On the front end, the empowerment we've seen when we're with customers in real time, whether we're at Nordstrom or at some of our pop-ups, the excitement they have when three girls walk in and they may dress similarly, but their hands all reach for three very different things. And it really expresses who they are. And that sense of empowerment is why we're called the accessory junkie. It's about everyone being their own kind of junkie, whether you're a yoga junkie, a mountain hiking, bungee jumping junkie, just go be who you are and then find the piece to channel that and, and go forward. And what are your margins? So we have a 71% gross margin on our direct to consumer sales. And for our wholesale with Nordstrom, it's at 50%. Maybe related to that, if I could ask, uh, what, what metrics are you tracking in terms of customer repeat purchase frequency and average purchase size? You know, what, what metrics are most important to you? Absolutely. So we have an average of a 38% repeat customer base. Uh, we have 5% of our customers have shopped more than five times in the past 12 months. Uh, right now, our data capture on that is actually more limited just because we don't have insight into tracking everything that Nordstrom is doing. We can anecdotally see the spikes. As new pieces drop in Nordstrom, we'll see a spike in customers who come over to our website and email signups uh, as customers realize that what they have is different to what we have. So we never cannibalize our own sales. And so really understanding and learning more about our repeat customer is a focus now that we've had the company for a couple of years and really seeing what that behavior can look like um, and seeing where her wallet size changes. As I said before, first time customers shop an average of $128 online. By the time they're a third and fourth time repeat customer online, their average order value is well and truly you know, over 300 up to 400. Wow, that's fantastic. That's exciting. How do you manage the artisans, their inventory and shipping timelines? So uh, historically, we took ownership of the inventory uh, for a couple of reasons to firstly uh, quality check, maintain the relationship directly with the consumer and everything is packaged up under the Accessory Junkies branding. Um, as we move to pre-orders, that will still happen, but the timeline will be different. So instead of having items that are ready to ship same day, um, the customers are notified that this will take three to five days or two weeks, depending on the piece and where it's coming from. But still, our intention in the next 12 months is to have the product come through us, again, just to maintain that direct-to-consumer relationship and to uh, make sure that it meets quality and inspection. Awesome. Well, Eric, any final questions, thoughts? No, I think what you're doing is fabulous. It's a win for Nordstrom. It's a win for the makers, the designers, and for your customers. It's really a great story. Yeah, I have to say thank you for helping Nordstrom's. It's good, it's good to hear that it's working for them because I, I do have a soft spot. Wonderful work, Michelle. Good luck. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.